All right, ladies and gentlemen, Kamadum Venthiv, greetings and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Census Roundtable discussion, where we'll learn more about what's next for Census 2020 in Indian Country. As background, on April 1st, 2019, the Census Bureau and NCAI launched messaging to ensure that everyone knew the importance of participating in the 2020 Census. And based on the 2010 census, Indian country faces the highest undercount at 4.9%. And this is, this is more than double to the next population. So uh, we decided to put forward as many efforts as we could in launching the messaging early so that we could start activating our communities. And although many of us have demonstrated these efforts toward a complete and accurate count, the COVID-19 pandemic has thwarted these efforts. And this conversation is meant to get us back on track for success. And so we're really excited for this conversation today. Uh, today we'll be chatting with officials from the US Census Bureau to discuss overarching 2020 census strategies. We'll also learn the latest information on field operations. And then we'll transition into conversation about how to get these updated information to tribal communities. Um, then we'll have some discussion about how to get involved, how to keep your communities engaged, and where to find the most up-to-date resources. So my name is Lucia Maddox. I'm a citizen of the Quetzal Indian Nation, and I serve as the Vice President of External Affairs with the National Congress of American Indians. So I'll be your host for today. And again, I'm just really thankful to have this group with us. Today we have D. Alexander, Timothy Olson, Michael Gray, Ann Davison, Matt Johnson, and Sandra Mitrovich here with us. And so I want to set the tone for this and really want to let the audience know that this is meant to be a discussion. And what we did to keep to that commitment was we set out um, a survey for questions because we really wanted the presenters to know from Indian country what you all wanted to know, what you want to learn, and you know just information and resources that will help you in your continued outreach efforts and information for your communities. So uh, based on the questions that were submitted, uh, we framed the narrative today around that. And uh, we'll also be um, taking questions if time permits. We'll take live questions. So just so that the audience knows to submit your questions, please use the chat function at any time during this discussion. And so without further delay, we will hand this over to Ms. B. Alexander. D is the Tribal Affairs Coordinator at the U.S. Census Bureau and is a citizen of the Cheyenne Arapaho Nation. D has been with the Census Bureau since 1998 and has an extensive background working with American Indian Alaska Native populations. So D, why don't you get us started? All right. Hey, thank you, Licia. Just a quick um, update. I'm getting some uh, text and email saying that they can see the slideshow but no sound or no uh, call-in information, so I don't know. <clears throat> so I don't know what to tell these folks, but just an FYI. But moving on, <laughs> I do want to thank NCAI and Lisa and her team. They've been a great partner for Census 2020. As you are well aware, they have a website regarding the Native Counts campaign. You guys get a chance to go to that website. They've been helping out tribes nationwide with funding for outreach. Uh, so they are one of our best partners for the 2020. Um, but we've been looking forward to this conversation. We did have a webinar a week ago on a Friday to let folks know and tribes know where we are uh, in operations for the 2020 census because we did have to stop operations for a little while. But uh, we'll get into more details about that with Tim Olson. Um, but we are committed at the Census Bureau, as you know, to get a complete and accurate count of the American Indian and Alaska Native community. We've been doing that and doing outreach since 2015, 2016 with tribal consultations, and we continue our outreach and communications with tribes and, and organizations throughout the decade. decade. <clears throat> Today, we're going to hear directly from our census leadership in charge of our field operations. Which is, going to, which is going to include conducting census operations on tribal lands in, co in collaboration with tribal leaders, as well as, those, as well as the tribal citizens that are living in the urban areas. Uh, then we will share some information on the communications campaign underway to help educate the American Indian and Alaska, Alaska Native community about the census and why it is important how to participate. We understand that when it comes to how the census will be conducted, particularly in this COVID-19 environment, there's uncertainty and confusion, and we are eager to use this call 
and follow-up conversations to answer questions and work together on the best way forward. In preparation for this web webinar, several of you submitted questions in advance, and we thank you for that. We will address those within this webinar, and whatever we are unable to address, we will follow up directly after. We, um, so now I'm gonna turn it back over to Alicia. I appreciate your time and participation in this call, and we will move forward with our uh, first speaker. Thank you, Dee, and we appreciate the partnership with the Census Bureau, and we appreciate everyone's time here today. So next, we'll turn it over to Timothy Olson. Mr. Olson serves as the Associate Director for Field Operations and is responsible for all aspects of data collection for censuses and surveys conducted by the Bureau. So these operations include three phone centers and six regional offices, which means that Timothy leads approximately 13,000 employees on a regular basis, and since the staffing is ramping up for 2020 census, uh, that will mean over 450,000 employees. So Timothy, go ahead. <laughs> Licia, thank you so much. I so appreciate uh, being able to be here with everybody uh, during this webinar. And a, a special shout out to the uh, NCAI for, for hosting this and all of the really amazing work you have done uh, throughout the decade and particularly in the, in the last you know, three, four years, really getting the word out to Indian country, how important the census is, it shapes our future, and, and how tribes uh, can participate and get their residents to actively participate. So I'm really happy to be here today. This is my fourth census. And uh, I started when I was three. Well, not really. I started when I was in my, my uh, late 30s. And uh, I, I don't know that this is my last census, it's still a possibility I could do my fifth in 2030, uh, but I'm having the time of my life right now. Uh, I, I'm going to share a lot about the field operations in, in the context of conducting a census in a pandemic, something that nobody in their right mind had any uh, foreshadowing uh, last year or the years prior that this would be our new normal uh, right now. So I'm gonna share a lot about what's happened how we're moving forward uh, to conduct the count. I want to start, though, is, is just affirming to everyone who is listening, uh, every tribal leader, every tribal resident, uh, every person who's here, uh, the Census Bureau, we are committed to a complete and accurate count of American Indian and Alaskan Native populations wherever, wherever they live. Uh, most live in urban areas throughout the nation. Uh, Many live also on uh, tribal lands. And the, the way we count in urban America and suburban America, as opposed to rural America is very, very different. And so I'll talk about that, but I want to assure you, you know, as Dee Alexander said at the very beginning, uh, we, we're serious about an accurate count. Uh, we've gone, too long and too many censuses where there have been undercounts. And when you when you look at the current environment with the pandemic, and it, it particularly is ravaging some tribal nations, uh, I want you to know that we are we're very aware of what's happening. We keep in touch with that. We're very sensitive to that. Uh, and we are working on the ground with local tribal leaders in each individual uh, reservation and tribal uh, area. When can we actually begin working? So uh, you've got our commitment. Uh, you have committed to us, and it's it's really a mutual uh, partnership that we have. So thank you for that. Let me go on to my next slide, and this. This provides you just where we are at as of right now. You know, I, I mentioned kind of in the beginning, we really have two different ways of counting the American people. Uh, those that uh, reside in uh, what I would call just regular house number, street name addresses, we invite them uh, via mail or dropping off forms. And uh, that happens throughout the nation right now. 60% of households throughout the nation have already responded to the 2020 census. And that represents 
nearly 90 million households. And you can see uh, we have an online tool that anybody can access. We update this every single day. And you can drill on this particular um, uh, uh, website. And later, I think we'll provide the, the URL, but it's basically 2020census.gov. And you can find this easily. Every single day, we update this at the state level, at the county level, at the city level, at the tract level, and at the tribal area level. You can see exactly where we're at. Uh, but right now, we're feeling pretty good. You know, we our goal for 2020 in the self-response phase, which is where we're at right now, our goal is 60.5% of households to respond before we start the non-response follow-up. So we're literally, literally half a percent away from what our big goal is before we start knocking on doors. Uh, we've got about 11 weeks until we start knocking on doors. Uh, Non-response follow-up throughout the nation and including in Indian country will begin August 13th of this summer. And so we've got quite a while to continue uh, having people self-respond. Let me go on to the next slide. And this provides you a current snapshot of how, uh, it's really a nationwide snapshot, but I've tailored this for tribal lands. And as I think many of you know, uh, we started the very first enumeration in Tuxuk Bay, Alaska. Uh, the director of the Census Bureau uh, was there and literally conducted an interview with the very first person counted in the 2020 census in Tuxuk Bay. I was with him personally. Um, we had a heck of a time getting there weather-wise. It was an amazing trip. Uh, while he was enumerating, I was in the school gymnasium uh, with the tribal leadership uh, doing an assembly with the whole village population. And uh, it was really an amazing thing. As I said to them in Tuxuk Bay, uh, the person who was counted first out of the 330 million people, really an honor, you know, that an Alaska native, uh, a native person in our nation was number one counted, uh, a, a lot of pride. So that has continued. In March, we began sending out census forms uh, invitations to households that have regular uh, 101 Main Street type addresses. That is what has created the 60% self response. We began field operations in rural areas in the middle of March, uh, particularly uh, in rural areas where we do a, uh, an operation called update leave. And this is where rather than using the post office to hand or to deliver census invitations, Census workers go door to door and they update the address as they find it. They GPS it on a census laptop. So we have a lat long for that address. So when we tabulate, we can put that count for that address in the right block, which affects redistricting and all of the funding that occurs after the census. Uh, and we drop off, we leave a census questionnaire package. So we started that in rural America, middle of March. And there's about, when you include Puerto Rico, there's 6.7 million addresses that are in the update leave universe. We went three days in dropping off questionnaires and updating addresses. And then the pandemic took over and we had to shut everything down. In three days, we had to shut everything down. We had completed a little more than 10% of all of those addresses dropping off the forms. So there's more than 90% of those uh, 6.7 million addresses throughout rural America on tribal lands particularly, never got an invite, never got an opportunity to respond to the census. Um, I will talk about that in a little bit because we have restarted. In August, I mentioned August 13th, a moment ago. Uh, our plan now is to uh, conduct our largest field operation. It's called non-response follow-up. 
And this is nationwide, uh, whether it's rural, urban, suburban, it, it's all areas of the nation where we literally follow up uh, with addresses that have not, that we have not received a response from that address. Uh, we'll hire about 500,000 people and they will work for four to 12 weeks. We'll be done by October 31st, and that will be the very end of uh, people anywhere in the country being able to respond to the census. After October 31st, there's a lot of work that goes on in the back end to uh, tabulate, to prepare the data, make sure it's quality data so that we can issue the apportionment numbers and then ultimately the redistricting data uh, that is used. Uh, I won't talk so much about that process. I focus on the field today. Let's go to the next slide. So right now, you know, I mentioned we in rural America in, in tribal Indian country, which most tribes uh, have selected the update leave method where we update the address and we drop off the form in March and people can self respond. And then after that, we conduct non response follow up with those that haven't responded. We literally just started and got three days of work done and we had to shut down. This map shows you by state, those individual states that starting um, earlier in March, March 6th, or excuse me, May 6th, starting in May 6th, we began reopening areas to conduct update leave and do the drop off of the questionnaires. Those that are colored darker blue, which on this map is the majority, uh, were opened from May 6th up through um, earlier May, the May 22nd of May. Those that are lighter blue are ones that we are opening and resuming field operations today, <laughs> literally today. And you can see in, let me point out New Mexico, for example, the lower half of the state, and we have a, a census office in Las Cruces, uh, that office opened up um, earlier in May. It was considered safe to do so. Uh, the, the numbers as far as uh, infections uh, had decreased and their hospital system was capable of of expanding if they had more people they had to care for, et cetera. Uh, so we opened Las Cruces in the lower half of the state, you know, uh, the earlier part of May. The northern part of the state, and we've got an office in Albuquerque that supervises the northern part, things weren't so good up there. So it's literally just this week that we are reopening the Albuquerque office and all of the enumeration that occurs in the northern part of the state. You will notice in Arizona, uh, we have opened all areas minus Navajo Nation. And Navajo Nation, we have one area census office in Window Rock, and we have been in direct consultation with the leaders from Navajo Nation, and it just is not the right time to resume uh, field work on their lands. So we have, we're holding off uh, that area until the tribal leadership says it is okay to resume uh, work uh, on our on our lands. I'll point out another state just to give you a reference, Montana. So there's one office for the whole state. It's in Billings, Montana. The data indicated the state could be reopened. So we reopened the entire state, but there are tribes and reservations in Montana. Uh, some are open and we have resumed operations on those and many are still closed. Their borders are closed. And so we, even though the state shows fully open for, for reservation lands that their borders are closed, we have not resumed field operations on those reservations. We are consulting regularly with the leadership of each of those tribes. And once they give us, once they give us the go ahead, we will resume the operations. Let me go on uh, to the next slide. Update leave, I've talked a lot about it. It's very, very simple operation. Uh, census workers drop off the materials 
when it's safe to do so. Each enumerator, each census taker, we kind of use those terms interchangeably. Uh, they will carry a census laptop, and you can see that in one of the photos there. It's got the census in blue. Uh, they will carry a laptop device, which is what they use to uh, collect the GPS coordinate for the, the housing unit. And they'll have a, a, a placard, uh, official business that they will put in their car windshield so that uh, people will know that there was census and they will have confidentiality notices that they would provide uh, to each respondent. Now, census workers, enumerators, while they're doing the updating, they literally go to each address, they update the address, and then they leave in a, in a plastic bag, water resistant, uh, they leave the questionnaire and some invitation materials so people who receive that uh, can easily um, respond. We hope they do. We hope they either fill out the paper questionnaire that was dropped off at their home and send it back to us, or if they want, they can go online and fill out the form using the ID that was provided in the materials, or if they want, they can also go on the phone. It, it's their choice. So let's move to the next slide. And this is where it gets very close and uh, illustrates where we are at right now in terms of completing the census uh, in Indian country. You saw earlier the nationwide map and it showed, uh, you know, we're 60%. This is an updated map, we're at 60.1%. And I said in that map, you can select tribal areas. And that's what this illustration is. They've uh, they're illustrating the national response, 60.1, and for ACOMA, their self-response is 9.1%, 9.1. And that's a direct reflection that we have not yet delivered questionnaire invitations to the ACOMA peoples. They have not received them because of the pandemic, because we suspended field operations, just now, just now, they're going to begin receiving census invitations at their doorstep. So I think, and, and if you've selected nearly any, um, any tribe in the nation on this particular tool, you would see a similar very, very low current self-response rate. It looks alarming and, 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 and it is, it is alarming. But just keep in mind that the residents have not received an invitation yet. So the fact that they even have any response is pretty remarkable, you know? <laughs> That's pretty remarkable because nobody got an invitation. Uh, the message though for tribal leaders is once you know and we have shared with you and you've given us permission to resume uh, this process on your lands. The message, the request from us is for you as a tribal leader and all of your networks on the reservation, through your tribal government, through your churches, your schools, uh, your health providers, uh, your housing offices, to get the word out to your residents that you're going to get a package at your doorstep. It is official. And it's so simple, please, please, please fill it out and mail it back. If you want, go online and fill it out. If you want to call the number, fill it out that way. But now that you're getting it, please do it. It's going to shape our future for the next decade. It's going to shape us for the next decade. And so now that you've got the opportunity, because it's at your door, please fill out that form and get it back to the Census Bureau. Let's go to the next slide. I will, I'm will. i gonna touch on this very, very briefly. Uh, we have uh, actively worked with tribal governments throughout the nation uh, to help get the word out about temporary census jobs so that we can hire local people who uh, are members of the tribal community um, and we can hire them where they live and they can work uh, in those areas where they live. We've been very successful, and this is in a period previously of the 50-year unemployment low. We generated, we have generated 2.9 million 
applicants throughout the entire country that have applied for these temporary census jobs. As I mentioned, we are hiring between five and 600,000. So we have a, you know, a lot of people in our applicant pool that probably will never get a call from us because we've been able to uh, fill the positions without going to, through every applicant in the pool. But in, on, in Indian country, uh, though we feel we have enough applicants right now, I, I would suggest to you that there may be some areas, maybe many areas where we can always use more applicants, uh, people that can apply uh, that we can consider for these uh, field operations. Uh, the thing is with the pandemic and lives changing, most of these people, well, all of the people in our applicant pool applied last fall, last winter and early spring. And so what's important now is when we go back and job offer these individuals, some of them have their lives have changed. They're no longer available to work, um, you know, things change. And so I, I would just encourage tribal leaders on here. Uh, our applicant uh, site is still open. People can still apply. Uh, you're still welcome to get the word out and uh, to help us refresh that applicant pool so that when we actually hire the non-response follow-up workers, we actually have enough people in and on each reservation to do the work. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I think I'm wrapping up here. On this webinar, we have uh, really amazing people uh, throughout the country that are listening in. And you will probably recognize some of these names. These are our key uh, tribal coordinators from each of our Census Bureau regions. Uh, Eva, Ron, Juanita, Jessica, Amadeo, and Marilyn, uh, they are listening. We don't let them talk. They're uh, being very quiet because uh, they're muted. But if questions come up today, uh, certainly there will be questions that come up that I can't answer. Uh, that's a given. Uh, they're going to be following up and, and helping us after the fact. Uh, if, your, uh, if your tribe is located at within any of these regions and you've got very specific questions about the census, these individuals are the ones that really are gonna help you out and, uh, and, and connect with you and provide that information. I believe that is the end. Is there another slide? Yes, there is. If you have more questions, uh, please, uh, from this webinar, you can always send uh, an email to that email address right there. That essentially goes to Dee Alexander uh, and her team, and they will uh, process that and uh, get anybody involved, myself, others, to help answer a question and get back to you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Tim, for all of that really great information. Just to summarize, there is a way to track your tribal community's response rate right now. And we'll get into some details and send out further information along the way. But you know, you, you touched on a really great point about it not being safe yet to go into Navajo. And I think that that's right. uh, you know, a really um, important thing to say, especially if tribes are having their borders closed still. It doesn't mean that operations will stop. Uh, it just means that you know, in tribal consultation, the tribes will let you know when it, it feels safe for them to open up their borders. And so one of the, the things that uh, Jessica and Matachi and I were speaking about last week on a census call for our uh, tribal grassroots coordinators was that um, if there are questions from tribal leaders and tribal nations about when uh, they will see uh, resuming operations, just because the state is open doesn't mean that it's open within right. tribal areas. And so make sure that you're contacting uh, the person that is, was on the last slide uh, right. within your particular region. So number one, know your census region. Number two, know your census regional contact because that will be the person that tribal leaders and uh, tribal mm -hmm. complete count committees will need to connect with to ensure that uh, there's 
lots of information for the communities and everybody knows uh, when operations will resume in their particular areas. So thank you so much, Tim. Really appreciate you uh, taking us through that today, especially the jobs aspect. You know, there are different phases of this operation and it's really important that uh, people are still applying, especially for ladder um, phases. And so um, the online application process has proven to be a little bit difficult for some communities. But uh, again, you know, D. Alexander has let us know that there is a lot of ways to be able to complete the application online within your community. So uh, right. tribal graphics coordinators out there, just make sure that you're checking in with your complete count committees, uh, tribal governments, if you haven't set something up yet, then please make sure that you do so that your, uh, your citizens know uh, that they have a resource to be able to apply for these yeah. jobs. And um, so yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks again, Tim. So now let's transition into the messaging and communications aspect of this conversation here. So what we want to do is learn more uh, from the Census Bureau partners about the messages that they're designing that appeal to American Indian Alaska Native populations. And we have a tag team here uh, between Michael Gray and Ann Davison. So we're really excited to have you here today. Michael Gray is the president and creative director at G&G Advertising. His firm specializes in developing advertising and marketing campaigns for American Indian Alaska Native audiences. And Ann Davison is a director at Guidehouse. And her agency is a multi-agency team that supports the entire communications campaign for Census 2020. So thank you um, for being here today. Michael and Ann, take it away. Uh, thank you, Lucio. Uh, Tim, thanks for the, the, the background on the operations. Uh, it's, it's good to know where we stand today uh, in this environment, um, what we're, what challenges that uh, we have come up with. It, it seems like time has gone really uh, pretty fast since we started this campaign four years ago, and you're absolutely right, you know, not knowing what we were um, going to be facing. Um, with that said, um, thank you all for, for joining this call. We all know how important uh, census is to Indian country and getting that accurate count. Um, when we started this campaign, you know, you can't really work for the Bureau without diving into research because they throw you in the deep end um, quick, quickly. Uh, so basically, as we got started, um, we wanted to find out, you know, people's attitudes and motivations towards the census four years ago. Um, and as we did that, it helped us kind of come up with uh, some pillars of messaging uh, that would resonate with not only all of America, but within Indian country and what were some of those key points. Um, what came out of that was the idea of uh, shaping your future as individuals, but what resonated more for Indian country was shaping our futures, our communities, our, our next generations of, of Indian people. So that's what's kind of where our basis to start this whole campaign was. And then throughout the course of this campaign, we ended up, you know, developing television assets, radio, billboards, PSAs, a lot of online social media, as well as earned media, PR um, type of stuff that, that, that grew out of this. And then, you know, as the pandemic hit, some of our stuff um, was on pause. Um, basically, the message wasn't saying that, you know, things like census takers were coming to your door. So we had to pivot and come up with some new things that would um, still let the Indian country know that the census was still out there. So some of the assets that we have, and they're available um, for your use. Uh, uh, you just, you know, use that email and, and, and Anne will talk a little bit more how to access a lot of the creative messaging and assets that we have come up with. So if we go to the next slide, I would like to just highlight um, one of the PSAs that you can run in your communities or on any kind of video thing that is available uh, for use is called Who Am I? And this was developed early on, um, but it is uh, uh, well received and um, for your use. So do we want to play it, Matt? All American Indians and Alaska Natives, we need an accurate count for the 2020 census. It's important because the data informs the funding of resources and programs in our communities. Your response will affect the next generation. 
So that is a uh, PSA that is uh, developed for external use. Um, the next spot was one that we had actually come up with during the pandemic. Um, we wanted, we, we knew that the Bureau had gone quiet a little bit in Indian country, not only operationally, but a lot of the advertising was, was a little bit uh, paused as well. And so what we did is um, the Bureau said, hey, we need to do something. We need to let Indian country know that we're still um, going to be there. We just don't know when. And then we were inspired uh, by Indian country and how we were coming together online. Um, I, I don't know, many of you probably know about it, but there's that uh, Facebook page called Social Distance uh, Powwow, uh, where people were getting together via their iPhones or their smartphones. And um, we thought, well, that's, a, that's an awesome message that we can get out to people that, you know, not only are we resilient, but we find ways to come together. And the census is that way as well. And then, um, so we're just now debuting this with NCAI uh, for the public. It'll go live uh, in a few days. So we're very excited about that uh, to be um, here with NCAI uh, showing this spot. And um, just, I don't know how many of people know him, but we, you know, we didn't, we didn't get to go out and shoot anything. Um, we did this all remotely. We gathered footage from um, 20 dancers throughout the United States. Uh, we shipped that stuff down to an editor in LA. Uh, we all worked virtually and came up with this spot. And we also worked with a, a guy by the name of uh, Christopher Takesgun, also known as AKA Superman, uh, who was wonderful uh, both in his music as well as uh, participating in this particular spot. So you wanna go ahead and run it? The 2020 census is here, and we need to do our part for our people. All right. Can we get some Lilies out there? That's great. Thank you so much for debuting that here with us on our webinar, Michael. That's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, it'll go, it'll be going live this week. Um, and we do, uh, we, you know, we are going to concentrate uh, around the update leave areas uh, where, where this spot will be uh, kind of featured. Uh, and then, uh, so what I'd like to do now, uh, thank you all, is turn it over to Anne to talk about other resources that we have available for everybody. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so to assist with your outreach efforts, the Census Bureau has developed numerous materials, posters, the PSI, PSAs, Michael mentioned. The best place to find these and to see new recent material is to just to go to 2020census.gov and there's a little search button up in the corner and type in tribal resources and you'll find the link here to this and other materials. Um, one of the most recent materials I think is really helpful, so I want to be sure to flag it, is this update leave fact sheet. Tim did a wonderful job explaining what that means, um, but I know many of you will need to explain it to your members and your organizations and your colleagues after this call. So this fact sheet has just a very simple breakdown in a Q&A format. Why haven't I received a census invitation yet? What if I actually already responded online? What should I do now? So this is great material for you to review, very simple questions and answers, and then to download and share as you can with folks. Also, if you happen to work with media as part of your outreach, the Census Bureau has a press kit just for AIAN media. So I encourage you to share this link with them. It's here on the slide. And it includes things such as the statement that was made just a week ago. Uh, Tim referred to it at the very beginning of the presentation. And it's the Census Bureau statement on outreach to AIAN update leave tribal communities. Um, I believe NCAI might actually have it as a banner on their website already. So great information here for you to share with media. 
Um, and then lastly, the outreach materials will continue to be updated now that we are getting back into the field and starting to have some more direct contact. We'll be providing you all, particularly tribal leaders and advocates, with some templates that you can use to send messages out, customized to your community. So this will be the place um, on this site here where you can access updated PSA scripts and messages that you can localize and customize. If you can go to the next slide, um, just one other thing for you to share. Our website has a number of downloadable, downloadable web banners. Um, they include banners that drive people to that response rate map. I think we might have an example here in the corner. Um, so if you would like to keep track of how your community is doing or you want to provide that ability for your visitors to your website, there's just some simple links there that you can include. So we look forward to working with you over the next few weeks and the months in the summer to make sure, as Tim and Dee noted, that we get a complete and accurate count. The outreach and the communications are so important, and we're here to help you with the messaging and the communications you need to help carry that message forward. And thank you so much for the opportunity to collaborate with you on this important webinar today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne and Michael, for giving us the update. We've had several questions about just outreach and communications, just making sure that the communities are up to speed with the latest information, because we have a lot of communities that are interested in making sure that their tribal citizens participate and we, that we actually achieve a complete and accurate count. So um, just like Ann and Michael mentioned, there are a ton of resources online, so we'll be sharing around links in our follow-up email. And uh, another way to get involved is, um, you know, we'll, we'll chat about that next. And so I'm really excited about this next uh, portion of our agenda today. We want to talk about how to get involved and how to keep your tribal communities engaged. And so please welcome Matt Johnson and Sandra Mitcherich. Um, Matt Johnson is part of the National Congress of American Indian Civic Engagement Team, and he is our Civic Engagement Associate. And Sandra Mitrovich is also on our Civic Engagement Team, and she's serving as the Wilma Mankiller Fellow. And um, so Matt and Sandra, let's talk about the Indian Country Counts campaign. Talk to us about the large native group of grassroots coordinators from across the country that you've been able to lead, what you're hearing, and outreach. What is outreach? How can others get involved? Matt, Sandra? Uh, well, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, hello, everybody. For those who can't see me, uh, my name is Matt Johnson. I'm the Civic Engagement Associate with uh, NCAI, uh, working with both Licia and Sandra on our civic engagement uh, team with Indian Country Counts, which is uh, NCI's um, census, uh, 2020 census efforts. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work, um, as Tim had mentioned, and as we all know, the pandemic really uh, put a real damper in uh, the field operations and, and subsequently uh, Indian uh, country as a whole was really affected by this. And, you know, I go and look at that tribal map almost uh, daily and you can see just the certain areas where they had maybe uh, more internet access, where they actually were reached before in those three days before the field operations stopped. And it's uh, just unfortunate, but thankfully uh, the Census Bureau is now opening back up. I'm really excited about that. Uh, we've been doing a lot of outreach, um, just reaching out to coordinators. We've had a great efforts from across the country, uh, you know, from Alaska to Florida, from Maine to California, you name it. We have spoken to many uh, tribal citizens who are working as a part of their uh, complete count committees within their their nations, and uh, you know they have been you know just like everybody they've been trying to figure out the best possible solutions to uh, you know uh, uh, work on this because of course they for some of them their uh, reservations are completely close to the outside. Uh, some of them just don't have the traditional, uh, you know, access to internet to fill out their forms that way. So they've been trying to figure out how they can best do things. Um, you know, we've, we've had a webinar series bi-weekly where we have had a particular state that we focused on. Uh, we initially, we did Minnesota, uh, followed by New Mexico, Texas. We have another one coming up this week that's focused on Wyoming. And just reaching out to coordinators in those states to talk about what their efforts are. And, uh, you know, you can point to some successes. Uh, Minnesota, uh, for those who don't know, is the, the best responding state so far in the census. And 
uh, with the coordinator there, her name is Shelly Diaz. She uh, had, you know, she started, she, she had had this great plan of having this massive rally. They were going to have the Lieutenant governor come and, you know, pronounce it as a census day. And it was going to, it was fantastic. But of course that got canceled. So they started shifting their efforts to, uh, you know, with, getting food out uh, folks. They were putting uh, flyers and, and information in those handouts to make sure people were remembering to actually fill out the census form. Uh, they held raffles for things that, you know, today we, we you know, cleaning supplies, for example, uh, that, you know, normally aren't a great draw, but in today's uh, climate, they're huge. Uh, and so, you know, just a great way to try and entice people to not only uh, take part, but then just, you know, to continue to do that. Uh, down in Texas, actually, in the, with the Kickapoo tribe of, of Texas, um, their organizer there, she um, she actually had a graph, which is always fun to see, but basically showed when they started their raffle and for cleaning supplies and to enter the raffle, you had to show your completed uh, or census confirmation form from your uh, from the website, and they saw almost a five to ten percent. I can't remember the exact number, but it was it was a large percentage. Literally, the graph went like this. <laughs> flat and then it went straight up so it was a, a great example of that um i'm gonna actually throw it to, uh, to sandra now so she can continue to talk to she uh as i said she's got a lot of closer uh, connection to it than me so uh sandra i'll let you go from here i'll meet myself uh, so go right ahead and introduce yourself hi hey tanani i'm sandra mitrovich i'm very excited uh to be a part of this team uh we one of the things that i just wanted to um add some stuff on to what matt already said we're so excited to offer opportunities and when our tribal coordinators ask for a call to action um, one of the things we like to do is respond and so as matt mentioned one of the things about these regional highlights that are very important to us and we do them bi-weekly uh, is that we're able to hear back from from our individual uh, folks in their tribal nations what they're doing how they're changing strategies many of you know that we gave census mini grants out to folks and, and they had to change their whole entire strategy. But I have to tell you, as many of you know, our tribal nations are resilient. We are doing what we can uh, to shift that focus. And so in order to support that effort, one of the things that, that we are doing is um, to host a, a variety of different events. This town hall, for example, partnering with all of our wonderful uh, U.S. Census Bureau partners, but also others uh, to ensure that whenever we get updated information, we're getting that back out to our coordinators. In addition, one of the asks from our coordinators is we need to continue to motivate our communities because we know that this is an extended period of time. How do we do that? What do we, you know, what do we come up with both both virtually, but not everybody has access, right, to, to those things too. Um, so we've talked about different um, activities in terms of phone banking, text banking. How do you go about doing that if that's not something you've set up before? Um, we are going to be launching a summer series uh, for June and July to really continue this conversation into the summer. We're also um, obviously with our civic engagement team focused on native vote. And so our summer event series, you'll notice, um, and we'll send out um, these invitations out to our to individuals. It also went out in our broadcast last week. Um, is in June we'll um, have both one week we'll have a wonderful fun event. You know how uh, competitive we can get, right? So we want you to bring that spirit with you. So we'll have things like family feuds, census bingo, paint and snack nights, and other things just to engage the entire family, bring that sense of comedy relief and fun. And if you were on the comedy night, last week with NCAI, you would you know how much fun that is but then also bringing um information resources continuing to be that wonderful network and build as we know how to do so um if you want to be a part of that listserv and this is really important for us um please email us at census at ncai.org so we can add you to our listserv and make sure that one you're getting our broadcast but also you're getting those invitations for the upcoming events Thank you so much, Matt and Sandra. The two of you brought up together a, a huge point, and it's about building a network. So we have the Census Bureau doing their part, we have the Tribal Complete Count Committees, and then we have this group of native uh, grassroots coordinators that we can also activate and leverage to be able to bring fun, bring information, and lots of consistency. So one thing that Matt and Sandra did not mention is that they've built a network of more than 1,600 of these native grassroots coordinators from across 
Indian country. This is east to west, north to south, and they navigate um, this group by allowing them a space to be able to have real conversations about the struggles that they're facing, but then also sharing best practices. You know, a lot of tribal communities face some of the same issues, and by convening together on a biweekly basis, they've been able to strategize and come up with solutions because we can, um, you know, call all of these barriers that we have barriers, or we can decide that we want to create solutions and activate the communities and really help our, our Native communities own um, complete and accurate count. So thank you so much, Sandra and Matt, um, census at ncai.org. And, um, IndianCountryCounts.org are the uh, the sites and the email contacts that you can uh, send us messages and join our listserv. We send out a bi-weekly broadcast email that has um, information, news, events, um, the latest resources from the Census Bureau, um, different types of meetings that you can join. So census at ncai.org and uh, we'll definitely make sure that we add you to our listserv and get back to you with um, any information that you're requesting for your outreach efforts. And so now we will begin the moderated discussion portion of our agenda. And this is something that our organization was really excited about as well as um, the Census Bureau because we really wanted to hear from you. We wanted to hear from Indian countries. What are the biggest concerns? What are the most pressing questions? And this is the forum to be able to do that. This is a discussion. This is a partnership and Indian country can't do this without the Census Bureau and vice versa. So I'll go ahead and uh, start with the questions. And um, so one of the first pre-submitted questions that we have was from Maria Rocha from the Indigenous Cultures Institute. And uh, she asked about um, the um, Indigenous uh, oriented graphics materials. And so we shared lots of information about where to find those resources on the Census Bureau's website. Um, and we will move on to Michelle Pinkham from Native American Rehabilitation Association of the Northwest. What are the disparities or barriers in obtaining census information from the urban indigenous communities versus those living on reservations? Now, this is a very important question because generally we're hearing a lot about hard to count tracks that are associated with rural communities. So let's talk about urban here. Who wants to take this question? Uh, Lisa, if you don't mind, I can take it. So when we talk, you know, about hard to count populations in rural areas, certainly there's some different uh, descriptions of what it means to be hard to count in rural, but in urban areas, uh, it's many of the same things. It's lower income or in poverty, it's uh, uh, renters, it's people who do not speak English as their first language, uh, it's people that uh, have less education, those are some of the descriptors. In urban America, uh, those descriptions really fall across across many different communities, uh, whether they're African American, uh, Hispanic, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native. And so what I love about the question is it's really honing in on what are the obstacles uh, to get an accurate count in these particular uh, communities, neighborhoods that have, have large numbers of renters, lower education, uh, lower income. Uh, English is a, is a difficult language to understand. And, and what we do, along with our partners, the 360,000 organizations that are partnering with the Census Bureau to get the word out, what we're doing is, is getting the message out. Number one, this is really important. The, the participating and in being included in the sense is really important for the, the things that will be affected for the next decade. And then to list off some real tangible things, um, you know, think about public trans transportation, think about funding for the local schools where their, their kids may be uh, involved or their grandkids may be involved, uh, housing, et cetera. And then in these communities, particularly mes messaging that census is confidential, that it is safe and secure, 
that individual's information cannot be shared with the landlord, cannot be shared with uh, immigration, cannot be shared with any other entity uh, that could potentially do them harm. And, and that message in, in neighborhood enclaves that are particularly hard to count, I think that is the hardest message to really authentically um, communicate in a manner that people will believe you. And, and what we've found through uh, decades of experience and research is to constantly repeat that message, whether it's in uh, food uh, banks where people are receiving uh, food, whether it's in uh, coronavirus testing sites and people are coming in for testing, uh, all of the different vehicles to get that message out since this is safe. Thanks, Tim. Just a follow-up question to that. How is the Census Bureau partnering with urban sort of centric native organizations or uh, community centers to ensure that uh, whatever their highest touch point is has the proper you know, messaging and resources and those types of things like that to push out to their urban communities? Yeah, I appreciate that question. And you know, we've got more than 1,500 partnership staff throughout the country. Um, some specifically work with tribal governments and in and, and Indian country. Others are focused in the urban areas. And I can tell you that in each, my experience in looking at the data is uh, the list of partners, primarily in every single city where you've got an American Indian community group, community organization. We're actively partnering with them uh, because they're, they are so involved in that community. I think of Minneapolis as an example. Uh, there's several really substantial organizations in Minneapolis that are providing services and representing the American Indians that are, are in the Minneapolis area. Uh, we're working with them locally. Uh, you think of Los Angeles, the same thing. Seattle. You know, probably, uh, you know, one of the large one of the larger urban areas with Alaska Natives and American Indians. I think of Anchorage, the largest Alaska Native village in the world. <laughs> um, you know, all of these groups we're working with those organizations. Our regional people are the ones that do this. I get to watch it, and I get to see the things that are happening. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to sort of pivot a little bit here to talk about those communications and reaching uh, the Native group. So um, this question says, what pitch has the Bureau found works best for influencing Natives to care about census participation? And this is from Teresa Melendez from the Nevada Statewide Native American Caucus. I think this is a really important question because we just saw two fabulous advertising uh, PSAs and lots of amazing posters and different types of materials. So what uh, research and what type of background on that messaging uh, did you all do to ensure that you were using uh, language and messaging that would really reach Native communities? Who wants to take this question? Um, Michael, you. are you on? Yes. All right, go ahead. Um, yeah, so like I said, we did the, the uh, research uh, about four years ago, we started research. Um, we went to communities like Kotzebue, uh, Seattle, um, Pierre, South Dakota, Bismarck, um, Albuquerque, all, all over Indian country as well as urban areas and, and talked to a wide range of folks about uh, some of the motivators and um, one of the things was about grants and programs that the census affects grants and programs. And you'll see that throughout all the material that was developed, um, such as the um, print ads and radio ads talk about uh, those kind of things, as well as uh, children. And, um, the, you know, those were some of the, the main motivators that, that, that popped out in Indian country was that the fact that what you can't really say what the census directly affects um, because it's indirect. And so, uh, what we found out was the about programs, grants, was, was important. Thanks, Michael. And I know just 
personally, because I I do this work for uh, the National Congress of American Indians, I've had access to your advice schedules and things like that. But how can our audience access when these ads will hit their communities? And if they aren't hitting their communities, how can they uh, engage with you all to ensure that something gets started? Well, one is to, you know, to basically when the Census Bureau posts on their website, the like the PSA and stuff like that, that's available for any community member to to potentially take and run where they can uh, type of stuff. So all that material is there. Um, and again, like I said, I go back to it was it was well researched uh, a lot. So that, that those messaging points are spot on, but that is available. Um, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, media dollars can only go so far. Um, and we have to be pretty broad with our, our strokes in Indian country in terms of where those are placed. Uh, you know, markets like Denver and LA are very, very expensive. Uh, so, you know, it, even though those are in update leave areas, but places like Bismarck or Billings or Albuquerque might be, uh, they might see a little bit more weight in terms of the actual paid media. But I'm just encouraging people that there's a lot of free uh, like I said, the PSA stuff out there, and I encourage them to use it if they're not seeing stuff in their communities. Okay, I think that is very fair. You know, I, I think there's a budget for everything, and so what it sounds like is that we're going to need to partner across the board with, you know, members of our audience and with our uh, census uh, coordinator groups to ensure that the messages are getting into the communities and, you know, at our grassroots level, and then if there's opportunity for for paid media, then that would be supplemental. So I appreciate I appreciate you uh, taking us uh, through that. And so that I uh, will go ahead and pivot over to another question. This question is from Jordan Bennett Begay. This question says, what would the Census Bureau do if the Navajo Nation does not give the green light before the October 31 deadline to open their borders? Does the Bureau have a plan on dealing with this? Who would like to take this question? Tim? Uh, that would be me, <laughs> Tim Olson. <laughs> so we, I, 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 I'm not sure really, honestly, how to answer that. Um, we, we do have, from an operational perspective, we have a requirement that we complete all of our data collection uh, no later than October 31st. And, and whether that's uh, self responses coming in or the direct uh, household enumeration uh, that we do during non response follow up. So, with Navajo Nation, our first job is to, once Navajo Nation reopens, is to deliver the questionnaires so people can respond. That's the first thing. Um, once that's done, you know, we've said that by August 13th, we intend to resume or actually start for the first time the non response follow up operation where we knock on the doors of people that haven't self responded. That assumes on Navajo Nation that we've been able to do update leave prior. And then non response follow up goes from August 13th all the way to the middle and end of October. Now, I, I think the real question is if we cannot uh, conduct either update leave or non-response follow-up, if we can't do that in any reasonable fashion, um, the, the real issue is then we've, we've got a different problem <laughs> and it would probably be larger than just Navajo Nation. So all right, we're gonna keep our fingers crossed. We're gonna keep our fingers crossed that we can do these operations uh, safely, safely to our employees that we hire, which are primarily going to be local residents, and safe for the residents. Uh, we're we're going to keep our fingers crossed so that we can do that in these time frames I've just mentioned. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate you candidly answering that question. It sounds like you're just going to have to measure the landscape and make sure that uh, you're doing it at the best time that works um, in consultation with the Navajo Nation. So, you know, there is there is you know some positive aspect of this because we do have 11 weeks before your next 
phase begins. So, you know, prayers out to Navajo Nation that, you know, the recovery and response is, uh, is you know, more timely than it has been so that, um, right. you know, they can resume somewhat of a, a, a new normal. Thank you for that. Yeah. So uh, this question is probably also going to be for you, Tim. It's, it's about um, the enumerators. Um, so I have two questions from Rita Martinez regarding enumerators. So uh, she wants to find out some more information about um, the uh, how you're keeping enumerators safe. Are you providing PPE when they go uh, door to door? And then also, um, are you all testing enumerators before they go out into the field to ensure that they are not uh, spreading? Uh, appreciate the question. I actually, from the Bureau's perspective, I've been kind of the lead person in buying PPE uh, at about 20 million items uh, throughout the world. So to answer the question, any office employee or field employee that we hire for the census or even our ongoing surveys, we provide all of them with uh, personally protective equipment. Uh, the basic thing is going to be a disposable washable uh, ma uh, face covering or mask. And we've already got uh, more than a million of these that we've received from our various uh, acquisitions. And we've got another million on their way uh, that we will be uh, using for all of the field staff throughout the country and office people. The other thing we provide everybody is hand sanitizer. And so if you're in an office, it's easy, you, you have big, uh, large gallon type things of hand sanitizer that people are uh, expected to use. If you're a field employee, you work from home and you're doing door to door activity, uh, it, it wouldn't work to give them a gallon container because uh, they're out and about. So we give them small, I believe they're three ounce bottles of hand sanitizer and we provide that on an ongoing basis so that as they are out and about, uh, they can constantly keep their hands uh, sanitized appropriately. We also provide gloves, disposable gloves. Uh, and if there's an area where that's a necessity or it's considered a local thing that's very important, they have the option to wear those as well. In terms of the, the question was, do we test each person who works for us? And no, we don't. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and pop up a question that I have personally received and our civic engagement team would agree. Um, I just wanna overall uh, set the record straight uh, for, you know, for everybody here in the audience about um, responding census IDs. So I'm not sure who wants to take this one, but Karen Cunningham says, before the pandemic, we were encouraged we were advised to encourage members to respond even if they did not receive a census ID in the mailbox. We later received notice that they would, that we should wait until we received the census ID. So um, some people have responded without the ID. What is the final answer for <laughs> anyone who has any concerns about how to respond if they have responded without the ID? I would say no pressure, but lots of pressure. Give it to us straight, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is Tim again. Uh, I know some of you are listening via phone and I was suggested to say who I am. So Tim Olson with Census. In the ideal world, and I'm talking about the perfect, happy world where everything is just like it's supposed to be, uh, a household- Rainbows and unicorns. Yes, yes. <laughs> they would wait to respond until they receive their questionnaire package uh, you know, delivered by a census employee in a rural area, right? And that has an ID in it. And that's the perfect unicorn world because, and I'll tell you the reason we've urged that, just to give the background. If somebody self responds online or over the phone before they get that ID, they absolutely can. They absolutely can. There's nothing that would ever prohibit them from doing so. But they're going to respond and they're going to enter their address on that response form. And because there's not that particular census ID that would be delivered to them at a future point, 
uh, the Census Bureau in the back end is going to try our hardest to match their address to an existing uh, census ID for that address. If we can't, let's say somebody's got um, a real route address or a PO box address that doesn't really tie their address to a, a location on the ground. If that's the case and we can't match it, uh, we're still gonna have to send somebody to their door to verify uh, in person that this non-ID address is really this address in our system or to add it to our system. So that's that's the reason for that. Now, if somebody has already responded online without an ID, and then we are able to now resume the update leave, and somebody will go door to door and drop off and update the address list, uh, there's no way for us to delete those non-ID self-responses that have already been received uh, from the questionnaires we're dropping off. So that household's going to get an ID questionnaire package. Uh, we, in, it, it sounds like kind of a hassle, but the easiest, safest way is for them to simply respond again. That way we have an ID response directly to that address and they can be certain, absolutely certain, that they are included in the census. And also because there would then be a roster with that ID response, say the paper form, it's much easier for us to match the earlier online response they provided. So that's the answer to that. I don't know if I, did I answer everything, Lisa? <laughs> yes, you did, thank you very much. So it sounds like, you know, there is some, background that uh, the Census Bureau can do if somebody responds without an ID, but just to ensure that the numbers are accurate, then it would be best if the person that responded without a census ID to use their ID when they receive it to um, be enumerated to have whatever method, phone, um, internet, or mail, they use that ID to ensure that they are triple checking their own work and making right, sure that right. they're accounted, especially with those that have unique addresses. We all know that, you know, as part of tribal sovereignty, we can make our own addresses and the fact that we have make it, you know, it just, it's a, it's a little bit different than how a lot of different um, systems are set up within the, within the federal government. But if we are all committed to a complete and accurate count, then, you know, we should encourage people to ensure that their census ID accurately records their, their home. Correct. Okay, that's clear as mud, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm that's, no, it's fine. It. You know, it's the easiest it's thing. It's a question is, that's come up. Yeah, yeah. For I, sure, I mean, so, I you know. I hear it all over the country, so we just urge people to, if they get that ID response, if they're able to just fill it out and mail it back, we're gonna be good. Well, and now we know why they may or may not have received their census ID at this point in time because, you know, operations, build operations have stopped and a lot of uh, tribal communities were directly affected by that. So they may have just tried to be proactive because of all of the wonderful uh, local tribal outreach efforts that are out there. And uh, they just wanted to make sure that they were counted. But so that we have an accurate count, we want to make sure that they use their census ID. Okay. So this one's gonna go into um, something a little bit more technical that may, I, I, Tim, I think this is gonna be you again because of data. Um, what, um, we have uh, Richard Rowland, uh, he says that um, he's concerned about the issues of differential privacy and um, he wants to know, uh, you know, what what's being done to assure tribes have control over their data and the ability to monitor the accuracy of the data. And so that's something that NCAI works on as well. You know, we recently submitted a letter um, to, to Congress and to the Bureau and said, hey, let's make sure that um, it's very transparent and that um, because of the small population, that whatever the methodology is, is that it is tailored to our data and not necessarily just all scrambled up the way that it would normally be. So does anyone on this 
you. Is that you, Tim? Can you take this question? <laughs> I, well, uh, thank you. This is Tim again. Uh, and I, I believe that I would be the most knowledgeable and also not very knowledgeable about it. So, uh, Richard, if there's a way that uh, we could get your contact information offline, and I think we would like to put you in touch with our experts that work on differential privacy, I think that would be a much safer and more accurate uh, use of your time and, and everyone's time here on the on the webinar. That's fair Tim, enough. This is That's D. fair can enough. I, but can I, oh, go ahead. This is Dee. Can I follow up a little bit with that? Yeah, please do. Sure. Just to let him know that we have been in consultation with um, tribes about the 2020 disclosure avoidance system, which is differential privacy. We've had a couple of reports. We did some uh, meetings with NCAI and with AFN um, earlier this year. So, and we also had several uh, meetings with our researchers, those folks that use the data, that know what agencies are needing our census data for tribes, what those planners use. So I'm glad to say that we're in constant contact with not only NCAI, but those researchers out there and planners that do use the data and know what they need. So whenever they did an overlay of 2010 data, um, there was a lot of concern because there was what they throw in noise to oversee the data. And there was a lot of, um, I don't know what you would say, a lot of concern, I guess you could say. So uh, our census team has a um, team that's comprised of different researchers and we did include uh, NCAI's policy uh, research center as part of that team to help us and moving forward when we're talking to tribes, letting them know um, the status and update. In fact, that's what, that was one of our presentations that we did uh, on a Friday, was it the, the 15th? But we are gonna continue to outreach to everybody about this program and eventually go back out to the tribes and let them know specifically when those 2020 data products come out, we're gonna need input about that and let you know what we are gonna be able to provide. But we're working, we're, we're working with the Indian communities, we're working with our federal partners. We know what data they use. We ask them specifically for their tribal programs, what data is pulled from census. So we're looking at those specific uh, groups. So just I just wanted to let you know, we are out there um, communicating with everybody. Thank you, Dee. Do you have any updates that you can provide to us on the extension for the census that was um, requested of Congress? Does anybody on this uh, panel have any insight? Dee, Tim? I'll, I'll pitch it to Tim. <laughs> yeah, I mean, We never said this was gonna be easy, Tim. Oh, hey, I, I'm just so glad to be with all of you. <laughs> I mean, the only, there's really no update other than uh, we are looking to the United States Congress uh, to uh, review and, and hopefully, you know, uh, take action that would permit the delayed uh, apportionment data and redistricting data to the dates uh, suggested. Uh, but I will say, you know, we have passed the point uh, where we could even meet the the current legislative requirement of December 31st. We we can't do that anymore. Uh, we we passed that for quite a while now. So uh, we're hopeful Congress uh, will will take action. We know that there was a, a, I think the House passed legislation a, a week or two weeks ago that did include the new dates in it. Uh, and it was a larger bill on uh, a funding for uh, the pandemic environment we're in. So, um, it, you know, I don't know where that bill is going. I'm not a, a congressional person, but uh, we're, we're optimistic. Thank you. So NCAI will also provide updates on any of uh, those, those current issues that are out there as well. And so we'll try to make sure that we get any updates up on our indiancountrycounts.org website so that with differential privacy, we have a lot of questions about differential privacy in our chat box right now. So I just wanna make sure that we, we flag that as um, a resource that our communities will need. So one thing I just wanna to mention to the audience is that um, NCAI 
is committed to our partnership with the U.S. Census Bureau and vice versa. You know, they have responded as swiftly as possible to any of the concerns and the questions that we've raised with them. So as much engagement as you all give to us, we ensure that we take those questions and those issues back to the Census Bureau. And um, the Census Bureau has, you know, generally tried to respond with resources that will help to answer those questions and provide resources and give us a direction of where we should send any inquiries. So I just wanna make sure that we, uh, that we put that out there as well. As we don't know what the communities need unless you all tell us. And so I'm just thankful today that we had everybody join. Uh, we had uh, more than 217 participants join this call for today. So I just wanna let you all know that uh, the information is getting out there and um, you know your time is very valuable. Um, so we, we still have a couple more minutes left. We have time for about two more questions. So I just wanna remind the audience that if you would like to submit a question, please do so using the chat function and uh, we will do our best to respond to the questions that you have for us today. So we'll just take just a brief moment while we uh, get some more questions in the queue. And um, go ahead, Tim. Uh, Lizia, thank you. Tim Olson here again. I realize that I put out some wrong information on this webinar. And I would, so I'd like to correct what I previously said. I talked about the start of non-response follow-up and I incorrectly uh, used August 13th as the date. In fact, the truth is uh, it is August 11th. Uh, so I, I know a lot of people are listening. What I said may have confused them because they've seen the August 11th date on our website. Uh, assure you nothing has changed and uh, that was just my misslip. So wanted to let everybody, want to let everybody know. Well, I appreciate the clarification. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have another question here. Um, and before I ask this question to you all, I just wanna make sure that the audience uh, understands what uh, self-identification means in terms of the census, because I noticed that there was a trend with some of the questions that we had from the audience today about how to respond and, you know, um, trying to uh, figure out tribal affiliation and those types of things like that. So can someone talk to the audience about uh, self-identification on the census questionnaire before we get to this next question? Who would like to take that? Dee, is that you? Yeah, that's fine. I can take that. So okay. um, self-identification, self we ask folks to, uh, they can self-identify up to six tribal names, groupings, or affiliations. We will capture that on the census form. We are aware that we have households out there that uh, have folks that are enrolled with the federally recognized tribe, but they also may have other tribal uh, affiliates. So for instance, you have a, um, a couple that has, say the spouse has got two tribes that he's affiliated with and, and the wife has maybe four. So it's up to, in my household, it's up to, um, I guess, between the wife and the, and, and the husband who's going to, uh, for their children, as you know, how they're going to be enrolled, which tribe. So, for instance, if you've got two on the, on, on the husband's side and four on the, uh, the wife's side, then those children could be, they could have up to six affiliations. So they would be person, like person number three would be my, my daughter. So she could list up to six tribal affiliations and we would be able to code those for the 2020 census. Um, online, if they do go online, you know, this was an issue back in 2010. Everybody said, we don't have enough uh, line space to fill out all this information. So apparently, you know, for this go around, we're, we've got 200 bases online where anybody can write anything out because we know our names are long. Uh, tribal names can be long especially if you're gonna write six, six of them out. So on the actual paper form, it's, you know, we've been instructed people to write it in that, in those boxes, write it on the side, you know, write it on top. Uh, somebody, if somebody has a question about that, they may get a follow-up call uh, just to confirm those tribes. Um, 
trying to think of what else there is. Uh, they can, you know, call on the phone and give those uh, particular tribal names to an operator online. So that might be a, an easier version as well without typing everything out. So that's another option. So, um, D, just to ahead. just to clarify, we they're only asking um, what tribal nation a person personally identifies with there's no verification process and so if you self-identify as like i'm a Kusan citizen i'm an enrolled citizen but if i just if i wasn't enrolled and i identify as Kusan, i could still technically write Kusan in there correct because yes, there's no verification process right we do not verify if you're enrolled in a tribal nation correct we did okay. have that question. Um, for the, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, no, that's okay. Um, so the question from a, one of our viewer, or yes, one of our audience members is, um, what is the purpose of the um, head of household marking their nation? And if they have other tribal affiliations within the household, how does that household end up identifying if like the children are from, or a relative that's maybe living there, something like that. They have multiple tribal nations listed under the same household. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so if the person, the head of household is American Indian, that housing unit, well, we will be collecting information, letting uh, census data know that how many uh, American Indian housing households are out there in the United States. For the other folks that are living within the household that have various tribes, that particular, whatever they list, is going to be coded to that particular tribe. So they will be coded. Say there's uh, a spouse or a, yeah, a spouse that has maybe, like I mentioned, four affiliations. Each one of those tribal affiliations will be coded to that tribe. Okay, thank you very much. So we, uh, we're nearing the bottom of the hour here, and um, I hate to stop a really great conversation, but uh, for all of the audience members here, if we were not able to get to your question, you can go ahead and email them to us at census at ncaai.org. We'll collect all of them, and we will send them to the Census Bureau, and uh, we definitely want you to receive all of the latest updates, so we'll be you know, distributing lots of information um, as, as we receive it through our bi-weekly uh, email broadcast and so also you can send your information to census at ncai.org and let us know if you'd like to join that listserv. You can also visit uh, indiancountrycounts.org for you know more outreach and funding opportunities. We've had two uh, mini grant um, funding opportunities recently and we are looking at opening up a third so that we can support community outreach efforts to ensure that uh, we get the word out about all of this wonderful updated information that we received here today and then also uh, 2020census.gov is a good website for anything coming from the U.S. Census Bureau so thank you very much to D. Alexander, Timothy Olson, Ann Davison, Michael Gray, Sandra Mitrovich, Matt Johnson for joining us today and all of our regional coordinators that were listening in for any regional specific questions. Again, we'll go ahead and make sure that we have all of the regional contact information in a very visible place for you all so that you know exactly who to reach out to for any questions in your particular region. And uh, that's all we have for today. So thank you again. And that uh, concludes our discussion. And uh, we look forward to a complete and accurate count. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.